uh, right, it's Basai Dai, to penetrate the fortress. Before I uh, get into Basai, I want to, uh, to reiterate my, the reason and my theme in uh, conducting these seminars. So I'm not here to uh, show you the way or to teach you truth about these kata. I will give you my insights and let you know my preferences. But, and beyond that, when you hear things from various instructors and what have you, they're all going to have a little bit of different take on how, what movements mean and how they're executed. So, kata should be viewed as something that you, you continually study and revise as you get new information. Uh, beyond that, in karate, if you think of it as there is no such thing as truth, then you'll be on the right path. Meaning, once you've found truth, you don't look any further. But, so, I would have you please uh, downgrade all your truths in karate, and most of them in life also, to maybe uh, working theories. That way there's always room for revision if new information becomes available. Okay, and you will never stop learning. Okay, Basai Dai. Basai Dai is uh, characterized by, uh, it has very aggressive movements. A lot of the movements are moving into the opponent and kind of screwing up his intention, entangling him, attacking the same time he's attacking. It has a lot of that kind of element. Also, Basai Dai has a lot of modifications of stances. A lot of the stances in Basai are, are more narrow than the normal stance. And Basai has a lot of hip twisting. So people who are studying Basai for the first time have to really learn how to twist their hip rapidly and fully because that's a, a big part of this cup. So let's start. We'll do the kata once together, as usual, and then I'll get into the analysis. This is more proper. 
And this is very relaxed, the left hand. Okay? Uchi uke, amorote uke. My preference is I, I, I will come back to here. It looks like most competitors, most teachers come back to the hip. Okay? I like to come back here because I don't have to change my grip. You just leave this hand on here. Come to your hip, you have to rotate to maintain this contact. And you do want to maintain contact because as you go forward, you have to follow and be touching the blocking arm so you, this hand can land quickly. Uh, in my mind, these two don't make, don't make any big difference because it's not your, your hand, where your hand is, that determines the course of the block. It's where your elbow is. So in the old days, some people go like this, and that's completely no good. Because it's, if the elbow flies away from the body, you just can't get into this position quick enough. So like I said, for other kata, this movement must whip, must whip. And the best way to get, get it to go quickly is to let your hip go forward just before you start the move. Then, then commit. Okay, and, and it has to be very quick. Same, same timing as a person who would punch it. Boom. Okay, so if a person punches zoop, you have to go zoop. Okay, you have to go at the same speed. You cannot go ba boom. Okay, because it, it doesn't make any sense. You'll get hit while you're here. So elbows are close to the body to whip quickly and hip goes forward. Now the feet, in the old days they came up and stomped down. Now it's just straight in, okay? Still, a lot of people don't get this quick enough because their step down is kind of like pum pum, pum pum. And it really has to go up. And the reason they're stuck down isn't quick. If it's palm, palm, it's because the hip's being left back. Your hip has to drive, drive forward so these two follow. Put up. Anytime you go into Kosadachi, you want to get that back foot in as quick as possible. Augmented black, fingertips are on the wrist, and the hand is firmly against your forearm. They eliminated a lot of these stomping movements that the old, old guys did, moving forward. And I believe the reason is, and you can try it yourself, if you go fumikomi from the side, you can stomp on somebody's foot and, and, and keep your balance. If you come forward, if you actually try to stomp on their foot, especially with your heel, you will uh, you will lose your balance. It might hurt them, but you, you, you won't be able to stay there. The classic bunkai for this is that the opponent's attacking the right lunge punch, and you are jumping in, so you're catching its hand while it's still here, and hitting him right here, so that such that his arm goes like this, so it stops him from, uh, from making a second technique by right? jamming his shoulder in. This can be easily modified by hitting the arm and then connecting to the face with a with little more extension. So it can be an attack and a block at the same time. Um, anyway, but the idea is, the theme is, stop the opponent in his tracks. You're moving in, stopping him in his tracks. That's throughout Basai. Next, Uchiuke. You cannot turn and then block. Okay, everything has to be done at the same time. So this leg shoots out, and then the hip turns near the end. You have to turn near the end. Always the hip snaps at the end of a move. Uchiuke. 
reverse of GOK. First, important thing about inside block is don't let your elbow go away from your body. The elbow and arm comes against the body, then the reverse block slides along the body and comes to here. There's no space between your elbow and the body as you're coming for the second block. Any little bit of space means it'll take a little longer. A lot of space will mean it takes a lot longer. Okay. People might not think about it, but this is a okay. reverse block. You turn the hip with the, the in-breath movement of the arm till your elbow past center. Then you screw it down. So the hip doesn't start turning at the very end. It's got it. Otherwise, you can't get to where you can block. And people, a lot of people do this naturally and don't think about it. But the timing of the hip is different than this one. This one's at the end. This one's prior to, but then screw it. This is a gapuhamni. Your hip must close more than uh, 90 degrees. The classic bunkai for this is that the opponent's coming and punching. So he's punching with this hand. Okay? And you're blocking the inside of that arm. And then you come and you, you again block the same arm before he withdraws it to push his, his uh, stance off balance like this again. Stop him from doing second technique. Of course, it can mean that you're blocking two successive punches. That's a, of course. But the, but the theme is stopping him from doing his next technique. The other advantage to reverse blocks, whether it be inside block or rising block, is from here, if you block to the inside by pushing the point this way, from here, it's very easy to grab their, their wrist, grab their wrist and give it a little quarter turn, so they're this way, and then you, you put your other hand on their, on their elbow, and you can take them to the ground in this fashion, wrist to the outside of the elbow. Turn the other way, down the hook very easily. We have a whole bunch of these, and they're obviously important to the kata. And the brown belts learning trying to be black belts, learning this kata, really have to have to learn to make their hip snap, snap, snap. If it's if that hip snap is sluggish, no black belt for you. Okay, so we have one, two, and we do outside block and inside block. Mirror image, in this case, standard hip twist. Okay. Next, it's called Sukuyuke, one of the scooping blocks. Okay, it comes to here, comes to your shoulder, and then finishes with Soto Uke, outside forearm block. Some elements. First, this thing. So many uh, beginners and some black belts want to do something first with this arm, like go up or something. And that doesn't make any sense. Kick's coming. So even though we're doing it slowly, you have to emulate and go directly from this position. Just turn and go to this position to make the block. Because if you go like this, that means you got kicked before you started to move. So this one just comes down. Okay. Second, beginners almost invariably are too close to the body with this block. Okay, blocking with the inside of the wrist here. Well, uh, let's see. I can demonstrate with this. Let's say this is an opponent's leg and, and 
this is his foot from here to here. Okay. If I if I block his ankle, I'm okay in this position. If I block him closer to my body, his foot's in my stomach. Okay, so this one can't be here. You got kicked. Where is this? Where is this supposed to be? Same, same as always. The reason people get it wrong is because they're cueing down, downward tight blocks from their leg. They have visual cue. It's this far from my leg. As my leg comes back, they pull the hand back, but it should, the hand should stay where it was relative to the shoulder, not the leg. Okay. In the old days, since in more time than before, we came to here and brought our feet together and brought this up like this. Now, this one draws an arc. It never comes, there you can see, comes along the floor and draws an arc to here. Okay. And this one comes to horizontal with the fist facing this way with the elbows slightly bent. Okay. Now, I'm not certain why, this is a fairly recent change. It's not in the best karate series, best of karate doing this. They both work. If you scoop the leg and come on up like this, the, the, his ankle will f slide from your wrist down onto your bicep. So it'll be closer to your to your shoulder. If you go like this, you can still throw it, throw the person. But I think my what I imagine they're trying to do is you're pulling up, you've got the person's ankle still on your wrist. And then as you turn over, you have a much wider arc to throw that leg even farther. This one is done slow fast without a stop. Beginners are not, are not going to be able to make power with this movement as well as if they use the drawing arm. So, you, the instructor, might think about introducing the kata, using the drawing arm, and only allowing the students to progress to no drawing arm once they get the idea how to focus both sides of the body. So each of you, in all your you know, whatever experience level you have, you try it both ways. And I think even if you're advanced, you're going to say, oh, the drawing, it sounds, feels stronger with the drawing arm. So this is, this is a tough one. It's because of the position here. But obviously, the, the more advanced your technique gets, the more you can still make power without that arm. So it's up to you. I teach you the drawing arm in the beginning. And then, then when they're Black belt, I tell not you don't have to use it. See, see if you can still make power. Okay, we're here. This one is done slowly, but it's Kamai, so there's no focus, just soft in the shoulders, watching. Then this one. Here we focus down. Okay? This is a, this in the book, here's a one move. That in the book it says tate shutoke, meaning vertical knife hand block. But but uh, I heard second hand that Sensei Ueki wants this to be executed blocking with the back of the hand, like this. Now what that does instead of knocking the punch to the side, just boom, it. It slides along the inside of the arm, I use the same arm, and then ends up hitting here. Boom. Okay? And what that does is it, the punch goes off to the side, but also you have stopped the opponent's forward motion for a moment. And handily, 
he's at arm's length if you hit him in the chest with this one. Okay? Like I said, this is second hand. So this, if that's true, uh, and that's the way they want to teach it, then actually the newest book has a change already in it. Okay, next one, punch. Uchiuke, punch. Uchiuke. Okay, the punch is straight. Uchijidachi. Again, don't let your arm come outside for inside luck. And this stance should be a little wider than normal. Get back where you can see. A little wider than normal. And when you block, you twist it hard so you make a complete right angle. One. Two, you have to pivot on the heels. Okay? So, what happens if you pivot in, on the balls of the feet, when, you, when the opponent's coming, your body will stay in the same spot. You're just rotating on your axis if you pivot on the balls of your feet. Like this. But you're supposed to be moving off-center. Off-center. Okay? And you can practice this. Have your, one of your buddies hold a stick at you and go, in. Okay, at your mid mid section, and without the block, you should be able to go boom, and the stick goes by behind your back. Come to center, boom, the stick goes by behind your back. You have to pivot correctly for that to happen. So by shifting back and forth. Um, third element is you got to be very certain, careful that when you twist, that your front foot doesn't turn out too far. And uh, it, people that can do this practice like trying to twist without moving your feet at all a few times. Or act like this to try and keep your feet right where they are. You're going to feel a real screwing effect into the floor. A lot of pressure on your feet that, want, that wants to rebound from that stance. But if you turn your out, outer foot forward, so it's more like front stance, you'll feel that screwing in effect go away. So you're less stable, and you're not coiled to, to rebound. So don't, don't turn your feet any more than you need to to get your shoulders perpendicular to your line of travel, uh, where you're looking. This is called Hizakutsu. It it's, uh, refers to when, whenever, it's also a hand for whenever your technique is, is, is going in a different direction than the stance is facing. Knife and lock, a bunch of them. So from here, important thing, again, don't let your elbow come outside the body, slide it along, slide it along to this position. Go the shortest route, and since it's way in this position, the right elbow is way behind me. As to come way over here, it really makes a difference if you travel an outside route. Then, of course, moving forward in knife hand block, you hit square until the last moment when they open. Okay. Square, open. Uh, and I said in the other seminar, I said that. Beginners invariably don't use this close the hip, keep it, keep it straight, open it at the end, and what they do is they swing lazily and end up with the front knee too far inward. Okay. So you don't want to be rotating through this movement. So we have this first block, another one, and then back again. Stepping backward in Kokuts, same, same idea as stepping forward, you step straight back and then your hip snaps and that's when your hands snap. When, especially when people are moving backwards, if they don't have this timing of the hip, they're always one, two, or one, two, their hip and hands are never together, especially beginners. So if you think about the in-breath where your hip is still closed, and it's the out breath when your 
hit opens at the end, that will uh, that should help you. You can practice this. Just the end part of the move over and over to get the idea of where that hip is twisting or when it's twisting. Okay. Sukamiuke, grabbing block. Important points are this, this does not have a double, the right hand does not have a double motion, just travels forward. It travels in an arc and pulls back a little, bit out, a little bit to the inside, a little bit, and then pulls back to your body. It goes under the left arm and comes to here. This one is a Coco Tiger Mouth. This one is straight. This one, the way I practice it, your thumb of the left hand is approximately near your elbow and then you bring it away just a little bit. Bunkai that I understand for this one. Um, one of them, you're blocking and then the, the I have to hold on the stick, the right hand comes un underneath and it grabs first, it grabs the inside of the sleeve here, about at the elbow. So the right hand goes limp and grabs the sleeve. The left hand then has to change position and push inward like this. Push inward. Kind of lock down and push inward. Then you're pulling the opponent back toward you. Okay? And kicking. Okay. So one hand is here and the other hand is here. If that's the interpretation, it'll be closer. The interpretation I like better is you block, you reach underneath, and you grab the wrist, and you give him, give him a quarter turn, which turns his elbow facing downward. Thumb downward, quarter turn. And as I said in one of the other kata, when you make a wrist grab from the top like this, it's very important that you don't compromise your own wrist. Your wrist should be pretty straight. And the index finger isn't really part of this equation. You can lightly squeeze with the index finger, but it's the other three fingers that make most of the squeeze. The right hand then crosses under the elbow and traps the elbow. And you're pulling down with the left and trapping the elbow with the right. Upper belts to get this idea, this bunkai down, you need to be able to do it without doing anything with the right hand except putting it under the elbow so you have the right position. So you should be able to trap, grab the wrist, put this under the elbow, and just trap in there, pushing down on the wrist, elbow trapped in the middle of your forearm. Okay, once you get that position, then you can get added insurance by turning his hand this way and grabbing a fold of his gi behind this pivot, almost by the armpit. And when you turn the hand, it goes like this and locks your fingers into the fabric. Now you got them locked in a lot of different ways. So then it has to be here. If you imagine grabbing with the uh, right hand up the middle of the forearm, no elbow lock, then uh, it would be up higher. Both sides. Okay, so regardless of what, you, what your interpretation is, the standard most popular target for the kick is right in here. So the opponent's getting pulled forward and getting kicked here, so he collapses. And if you if you kick him that way, he's going to fall right on his butt. Okay. The other interpretation is you can come to the outside of the knee. His knee is here. Come to the outside of the knee and press the knee inward. That goes to the ground, possibly dislocated. And again, he's down on the ground. Uh, either way, to learn 
First, the pulling comes to here. Gion is here. We do Teki Nidan here. Basaya, we move the, what would be Gion, the left hand into the right, so they're both near your right nipple. The two arms are parallel to each other. The forearms are parallel to the ground. And the elbows are lower than the shoulders. You do not, a lot of people pull up, but you're not pulling up, you're pulling in. Pulling in. If you have a pull up feeling, you lose connection. Pull in to here. And you should be able to stop here. If you can't stop because you kick too high and you're all bob bobbling all over the place, it's because you kick too high. Okay, you should be able to stop there. Second, to clear either the knee or up here on the thigh, you really got to get this leg up there to clear, to make the, the uh, kick. Okay, so that's important. Lock the elbow or just grab the wrist, pull into you, keep this up high, <clears throat> make a long key out because this is like a, this is like a, this movement is kind of like a battering ram against the castle door kind of bingo. A prolonged squeezing. If you didn't kick the point, you're going to have to squeeze against his joints to make him go down. You have to turn the foot. You have to turn the foot as you turn your body because you're making side thrust kick. So if I was making side thrust kick to you, the camera, I'd come up like this, like front kick, and then turn the hip sideways. So I'm coming up like front kick, forward, and turning the hip sideways. Okay. And this answers the question of why is why don't you pull to center? Why why are you pulling to your right chest? I ask my students this. Hopefully black belts all know the answer. You pull to the right side because because that means you're pulling straight because your body turns sideways. So you can't pull to center, it's not on the center line anymore. This is your center line once you commit the hip to side kick. Okay. So let's pull it more to the right side. Okay, after the kick, withdraw this foot and make the knife hand block. Step forward again, another knife hand block. Then, movement 22. Two rising blocks. They're not really rising blocks, but that uh, feels like that. The important part about coming here is so opponents either grabbing here or maybe trying to grab your neck. You can't come from the outside with your hands. You have to come together in the middle and then come up so that it pops his hands up to here. Okay, and. Any of these kinds of movements where you're, you were down and now you're coming up, use your knees, use your knees for leverage to make the movement. You cannot do this, straighten the knees and then keep moving the arms because your arms aren't strong enough to keep a 400 pound guy off your back. You've got to lift him with your legs. Okay, next one. In the best karate and the Sensei Mori style, we come to here, Sensei Mori had to bring the knee up, but again, a, a lot of these moving forward to uh, stance, knee up, they have been eliminated from the kata. Um, best karate was published in the 70s. The first issues were like 69. Um, but the changes from best karate to the current text are very small compared to from the old days to the best karate days. So again, Sensei Nakayama made most of the changes, and the only thing JK has done to best karate is kind of fine-tune some of the movements. Um, at any rate, in best karate they come to here also, but no knee up. Again, I think because if you stop down at somebody's foot with your forward, in a forward position, you will lose your balance. In side position, you can break his foot and 
maintain balance, but not the forward position. So now that they're advocating going up instead of out, and the reason for this is clear. If you, and a lot of students go down with the elbows, beginners, and this is completely bad. If you go outward, the opponent's arms get thrown out to here. He can return and do the same thing to you that you want to do to him. And, and it's a maybe 50-50, uh, Russian roulette, who's going to get from here to here quicker if you throw his arms out. If you bring his arms down and your elbows drop, then his grip goes like this, then he's, he's going to beat you to the punch, literally, to, to strike. So by going up, this pops his arms up in the air like this, and now he's all open, and you can, you can uh, come in quickly, and he has too big an arc to make the same speed that you can make. This movement is called Hasami Uchi, scissors, scissors strike, hammer fist, scissors strike. Okay. This movement must not be skipped, it must be done powerfully. And a lot of people make the mistake of coming with their arms angled up, but this should be a lo pretty low strike. You're trying to hit those small ribs, your very lowest ribs, which is just a little higher than where you would chamber your fist with for punching. So this is nearly horizontal, horizontal or nearly horizontal. Then the next one, Oizuki, is shift. Don't, don't make some kind of stutter step. It takes too long. It takes a long one. If you go like this, palm, the opponent's right here. So if you go like this, if you go in too far, uh, it's not going to make sense. So from here, you just punch right from here. Uh, that said, you can, you, it's okay to make this stance for black belts, to make this stance a little bit furubachi ish. Little, little bands of okay, so you can extend for the punch. But uh, brown belts, I would not. I would not encourage them to bend that knee because they'll just make a weak stance. But once you understand how to make a front stance with the knee a little bit bent, meaning you've practiced uh, Zanku Tsudachi, Sochin Dachi, and Hange Tsudachi many, many times, so you understand the dynamic, how to, they can kind of interact with each other, the form, then it's okay, a little bit better. go. Anyway, you need big, big, bam, dango, not pam pam. Really hit him hard, then make a second punch punch, or a second part technique. Next one, this one is, is protecting, maybe a block, maybe not. This one comes up as if you were gonna do Shuto Uchi, which is exactly what you do, just like on 5 This is Hasami Uchi, sweeping block, face punch. This one strikes to the inside of the thigh. This way. And then one, same count, you come to here. And the Bunkai is exactly the same as hand 5 you're striking to the groin, and on your way back, you grab him by the leg, you pull his leg out, keep low so you have leverage to do that. Once he's off the ground with the front leg, you put this one across his neck, and you continue upward. This is come on. You're just getting ready once you're finished with this technique. So you don't you don't have to focus this one. Just watch. Are we okay with that one? Strike. Strike. Fast, then slow down. Watching, watching, waiting. Uh, this is a pet peeve of mine. And you should study this in all your, your, uh, all the kata movements. You have to go directly to the target, which means you have to set up your feet go directly to the target. You have to set up a clean line 
in this case with an arm technique, with the elbow. So with my back turned to you, a lot of people, first they start with the arm, which they shouldn't, they should be turning right away, and the arm coming up at the same time. Second, they bring this elbow over here somewhere. Well, that's the elbow line, when you're punching, is already centered, and you want the elbow to stay on this center line, to stay on the center line. Okay, it can come this side a little because you're striking, but it can't come back here. That doesn't help you strike. Next, get on the right. What's different about this one, different than most of the cut and different than him, go down for sure. Because you start from an elevated position, this one is done in one arc with the elbow, if it doesn't come to the inside, goes over the top of the head and comes down. Just letting, kind of letting gravity help you make this block. Okay. So don't, it does, don't, don't be too stiff with it, but it's very important that it doesn't swing off the line again. You gotta stay, stay on the line, the vert, this vertical line with your elbow, and finish with your stem. Kakiuke, hooking block, just on hand five, and turn over at the last minute. In the old days, they did it flat. In the Middle Ages, they turned it throughout, but now everybody's going boom and turning it over at the end. Uh, next movement, exactly the same as Heyangura. Crescent kick to make it to make your crescent kick. The points I made for Hangora, your crescent kick shouldn't rise to the target. It should come slightly arcing above the target. Okay. To do that, you have to really push here while pulling back with the retraction arm so that your upper body stays back after the kick makes contact, so you have full swing. With the, for the elbow strike. So really, really a push here to get that kick to go high enough. And I also mentioned just just for half five, just practice. Just uh, put your put your hand there and just keep hitting it. And I can't kick very high anymore, but it's somewhere where you like it. And just just keep hitting it. Try to make a slap. Boom. 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 To slap it has to be coming in, at least horizontally. If it's coming like this, it won't make a slapping sound. Okay. After, after this, my MP, same as hand five. Okay. And I explained before the difference between my MP and Moashi MP is a, the fi finished position of the elbow. So this one it must brush, you must brush your arm on your hip and come to here. It does not come to the outside, even a little bit, just, just like a punch. In fact, it's so much like this one in tacky. It's just a little different. It's, al it's almost exactly the same. Okay, because your elbow in this movement in tacky is moving forward. It's so almost the same motion. My MP. Then three. Down block, and uh, this is called, is in the book says Kamai. This is Kamai. This is not an augmented block because you're making contact before this can, re this can really lock in. So it's not really doing anything except sturdying your, your arm, one, and two, protecting, protecting your solar plexus from the front, the frontal attack. So somebody's getting close, bam, 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 hitting over and over, and you're protecting at the same time you're making this block. It does add stability to this block at the very end. And this is right, right on the elbow. This hand is this way, right on the elbow. Okay, some people do the wrist 
and this way. But the book says this way. You have to relax your stance between each one. A little bit re relax your butt, relax your rib cage, abdomen, and your armpits so you can move and knock everything down. And your hip can make a little bit of a little bit of twist. This is very advanced. It's more important in the beginning, meaning your first 25 years, to just lock the hip down, lock it down, lock it down, lock it down, re remake your stance. Relax it a little, remake it. Relax it a little. Okay, then you can start to play with this. How far can you snap the hip and not lose the integrity of the stance at the knee joints? Okay, this one is Kamaya. Take a very narrow, narrow front stance. Very narrow. Why narrow? Because you're the opponent. If I come to here, I come off the line. I have to stay on, stay on this line. So narrow stance. Nick, this is a, sink, a different count than goal. Okay, Yamazuki mountain punch. Why is it a mountain? Uh, because this U shape looks to the Japanese like their symbol for a mountain, the kanji. Okay, so if you, if you don't read, read Japanese, it, you just have to remember mountain punch. The important thing about this is the two hands, if you go to, up to a vertical surface, they're going to be both equally forward. A lot of people make the mistake of leaning in too much. This takes the hip out of play. The hip should be pushing this way. Okay, the only thing you have to do that's not, that is not just playing vertical like lunge punch, because you have to open the hip, and then you have to open the body even more and kind of tilt this upper shoulder forward to get this one to come as far as this one. So you're, you're a little bit, a little bit of tilt, but you're not leaning. Okay, if you lean forward too far, you can't get up again quickly. This one, meaning is stop the kick, or even block the kick. Kick's coming, block it to the side. The important thing about this is, you cannot lift this knee and then start moving. If somebody's kicking you, and they mean to hit you where you stand, when you lift this knee, if they hit your shin with a kick, it's going to be going full force. It's going to be almost all the way extended when it hits you. One, so they, they've got a lot of impact. Two, you're standing vertically on one leg. Guess what's going to happen when you take impact? You're going to fall backwards. So this one you do as you're moving in. You have to lift this knee. You have to, your hip has to be moving in, and you catch him in the middle of his kick. It's very important, otherwise it doesn't make any sense. Then you make Yamasuki. This one, the meaning is punches coming to face. This hand slides, slides under the punch and, and deflects it upward and continues to hit him in the face. Slide under the arm, hit him in the face. While he's busy getting blocked with his punching arm, this one is punching low to his family jewels or thereabouts. From here, re recovering from these, you're not focusing, this is just getting ready. So just come, bend the knees, rise up at the end, and just watch. Breathing steadily throughout, and you're not doing any pain or something at the end. Because you're just, come on, you're getting ready. So we have a few of these, they're all the same. Next, this is another Sukui Uke swooping block. Okay. Important elements are that. Uh, well, first, the meaning is that you are 
hitting the kick sideways, kick coming low, so you have to make a deep stance. Coming sideways, curling your hand over, and knocking the leg downward or a little bit to the side. The beginners are always doing this. Some kind of ooh, shoulder action. Okay, but it should be. As soon as it gets to here, the elbow doesn't move. You just pivot around that that uh, focus focal point. So you come to here and snap the hip. You come to here, snap the hip. And wrist must be lower than elbow. I think most people understand this part. But the part that people aren't getting is don't use your shoulder. You have to quickly, really twist the hip and make the movement. Uh, almost lost my earpiece. Hang on. And this is extremely difficult to do with any speed, the actual application. It's one of those, huh, maybe, maybe somebody way back when could do it. But uh, very hard to do full speed to the actual front kick. Um, the mistake a lot of people make is, let's see, how can I best show you? Okay, I'm gonna go here. Again, the course of the block, it's, you're blocking toward the back of my room. So you can't bring this hand out here somewhere and then come, come like a scooping, kind of change the course as you, if your hand's back, you're changing the course as you're coming down. Kind of going like that. So the hand from here should come to here. Make sure that your hand and your elbow are on the line they're trying to block. What you're supposed to do with this one is close your hip, close your hip, and again close your hip. Two snaps. Okay? Go ahead, try it. Try it slow. Close, open, close. Close, open, close. You can do it slow. But I, I looked at a bunch of videos and no, almost nobody can do that. Naka can do it. Corey Hart does it a little bit. Pretty good. The first snap is not that strong. Uh, but nobody else that I saw. I was looking at tournament videos. All the black belts were just closing the hip one time. So typically, it's not quite locked in as you're to this point, and then, then you screw it in at the end. So that part, screw it in at the end doesn't change. So you, please, practice that. And I'm sure if any of you get that down pat, please teach me. Uh, but I'm sure it's going to frustrate most of you. Okay. Next, knife hand block. Now, uh, in the old days, more sensitive, you know, this took a full step here. This is not a full step. If your brown belts take a full step, or you do, you're gonna make it on smooth. This is an adjustment step. So, in front stance, I wanna go that way. I have to adjust to bring this foot under my center of gravity. So because this is front stance, it's about a two-third step. Okay? To bring it under my center breath. Then I block. Second point, don't bring it to the finished position with your, with your toes pointed outward. Bring it, don't move this foot from the, the angle of this foot in front stance. Keep it the same angle. Then as you turn to make down block, you pivot on the heel and go into back stance. So, adjustment step, then here, then now, oh again, I went way back to the front, to, uh, near the right legs far, so it's about two thirds, but only come under the body. If you see somebody do this, then it's wrong. Only come under the body. So as you go like this, your upper body doesn't move. 
Uh, what I want to, let's do this exercise. So just, we're going to make a knife and block, and we're going to do a adjustment step. And I want you to feel the difference between pulling this back foot and leaving it in the same position on the in-breath and then making the out-breath. Same position on the in-breath, making the out-breath. That's a very weak step. If you were moving forward in stance and this foot's pointing outward, you wouldn't drag it with it still pointing outward. It would start to move inward using the groin muscles. So instead of coming to here, turn this foot in just a little and pull your knee in. Then put it back out. Pull your knee in so it feels like hunger stance. Then go. Alternate between the two. Just plain. Doop, de doop, de doop. Which is what all the brown boats do. De doop, de doop. They're not using their groin muscles, they're just kind of hopping through the movement. To more dynamically squeezing and then releasing. Squeezing, releasing. Please experiment with that. Uh, otherwise, you know, you'll have no idea what I'm talking about. Application of this one. You block the pony, you grab his wrist, and you throw him behind you off balance. Very difficult. Unless your technique is good, then it's not so difficult. What makes it difficult is if your weight is too much centered, too much on the front leg, it's hard to move this leg to the side. And you're also not pivoting on this axis, which is what's making the power, pivoting on this axis. Okay. Second, this position on the arm is very strong. I found block. If you try to do any kind of pulling with the left, right arm after you block, pull the wrist with the arm, the arm will lose connection. So the arm does nothing. It locks in, you grab, and you turn like a door. If you get your weight back far enough, then you don't change anything in the muscles in the shoulder, you'll be able to pull a pretty big person sideways. But if you think of it as pulling with your arm, no chance for you. Okay. And people who make this knife hand block out here, who are using their shoulders too much, they can't do this move either because this is a weak position. This is a strong position. And if you understand knife hand block, you'll be able to strike more strongly here than you can here. The weaker strike. Try it. If you find this to be a stronger strike, it's because you're not focusing. You're using the shoulder. A lot of momentum. Once you learn how to focus your center, this one locks down. <coughs> this becomes the stronger technique. Only if your focus is good. And on that note, last movement, if the kata ends in a block, especially with the kiai, don't think of it as a block. Think of it as a strike, a killing blow, the last guy, you are taking him out with that technique. You're not blocking, because then you have to follow up with something. This one can hit. If you feel around right under your jaw here, uh, there's a little hole there, right at the corner of the jaw bone, under, on your neck. This will cross, if it's at the right angle, will cross under your chin, Hit that little hole with this part of your hand quite readily. And that's that's one of the vulnerable points. Right right there. Not the neck. Neck is pretty heavily muscled. Right in that little hole. Okay, you should be able to shock the opponent and take him out. Batsai Dai, Sensei Nakayama was very uh, enamored with this kata he thought was very special among Shotokan katas. Thought it really important. That's why uh, the transition from brown belt to black belt so often we do basai dai for the testing. <laughs>